join our Patreon. Do you really want to know? We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Today, I have someone that I've been trying to get on for quite some time. He's a busy man. Uh, but he had a couple books that uh, were out, and now he has a new one. Um, Michael Lawrence, how are you, my friend? I'm very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad to have you on. I've watched quite a few of your YouTube videos in the past, and I said, man, we got to get him on. And uh, we've tried connecting in the past. Things weren't working out because there's so much time. Uh, you're busy. But now with everything that's going on currently, you have a little bit of time, and I'm glad to get you on. Excellent. Yeah, yeah I've been traveling quite a lot. I travel for work. Uh, the coronavirus has just meant I've been furloughed. So yes, and that's given us uh, it's given us the whole of May to uh, to play with. So yes, sir. Um, just to give our audience something that I think is very important, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you got to stick around for this because <clears throat> th this goes to the heart of like my own journey, if you will, and and why this is important on trying to figure out this Jesus character in the New Testament, but. Um, he's written a book, okay, Contra Ehrman that I read. This is obviously something he stopped publishing or stopped uh, pushing because he has now created a book called 70. And that book has all the material from his previous books and a whole nother level to it in which he's presenting a thesis we're going to discuss today about the historical man named Jesus or maybe historical <laughs> Yeah, so tell them, tell them a little bit about yourself, Mike, and we'll get into some of this um, material. You don't mind me calling you Mike, do you? Mike, yeah, I prefer Mike. Yeah, okay. I, the book is Michael Lawrence, if people are searching, but I, I prefer Mike socially, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I suppose first, uh, I'll, to the best thing to do is to let the viewers know where I come from in this, because I don't come from the scholarly background. Um, I, I come from a, a campaign angle. Um, in the United Kingdom, people in America might not know, we, have, we don't have separation of church and state, and we have laws which uh, mandate religious education, which is really religious indoctrination in some of the more virulent, virulent schools, and uh, compulsory worship every morning of a Christian nature. So children from the age of four onwards in the United Kingdom are forced to sit and pray to a deity called Jesus. We also have um, automatic entry for the Church of England into our lawmaking body in the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And uh, certain uh, privileges in society for the Christian organisations. My argument or, or my beef is that if this is real, then all well and good. But if you're going to have that level of uh, privilege in society as a Christian organisation, I think we at least ought to establish whether there is any legitimacy in your uh, theology or not. Now, I, I'm not religious myself, but we at least ought to establish whether this person that we're asking children to worship every morning did actually exist in history. So I campaign against the, the enforced indoctrination of children and, and to have that law revoked in the United Kingdom. However, alongside that, I do have a person, a deep personal interest and have had from, from my school days in mythology, Egyptian Greek mythology, and theology. I'm not religious, I, I never have been religious, but I've always been uh, intently interested in uh, the origin of the stories and what the stories are trying to, to tell us. So that's where I started the studies from. I actually can relate, Mike, I, I, um, in a different way. I was religious, but uh, I think it's funny how something like this takes a keen interest to the religious and non-religious. I think it's important because I think really beneath all of it, believer or not, it affects us all in very similar ways. And and I'm with you because, uh, you know, someone might ask who's a Christian, why are you so interested in still researching this and, and studying this? Well, I have found an interest in really finding out what I think is really going on and uh, really getting to the bottom, as Dr. Price says, am I an enemy of the Bible? No. In fact, uh, he says he's the champion of the Bible, right? Well, what's he mean by that? He's not saying I'm the champion of this indoctrinated method surrounding this book. No, he's figuring out the problems with it, the difficulties with it, things that we would never really consider, how God created uh, the earth from the carcass of a dragon in certain scenarios. Like, just weird stuff that, you know, I think is awesome because 
it, for me, it was used as a weapon to control and it was used to, you know, like uh, I always debated people and this sect would debate this sect and it was who's superior and whoever had the more superior knowledge and understanding of the book and could use it better to debate the other book or the other people who, you know, are trying to understand the book won. Well, at the end of the day, I'm finding out all these guys have this thing wrong. They're all standing on sand thinking they're going to build a house. It's all, it's all shaky ground. They don't really know what they're standing on. That freed me. And guys like you who wrote Contra Ehrman, of course, and now 70 uh, are presenting new theories, which I, I'm intrigued to hear. Thanks. Yeah, but you're certainly right about the, the consultant, certainly from 325 from your onwards, post-Constantine. time. It, what, uh, Christianity was a control tool. Uh, and although it's an uncomfortable truth, uh, Christianity spread across Europe in exactly the same fashion as the Islamic State intend to spread Islam and create the new caliphate. It, it was done in the same method. Uh, and to, to not accept that really is, is denial. It, it wasn't the case of that the, uh, the preachers come or, or the apostles come and they visited all the lands like St. Patrick went to Ireland and gave this message and it was fantastic and everybody just said, that's brilliant, I, that, that's me, I'm going to follow that. It was spread with the sword and post 325 you had two choices, you agreed or you perished. So that doesn't in itself mean there was no truth in the historicity of the character, that just, that's just the indication of that's why we're all talking about this character now. And it's also interesting that in the four-way civil war that Constantine was involved in, it, by pure happenstance, he, he was the victor. And because he's the victor, we're all talking about a Jesus character today, and was he historical, was he mythical? If he hadn't won, had Licinius, Maximinus Dyer, or um, uh, Maxentius won that war, we'd be sitting here today wondering whether Mithras was historical or mythical for exactly the same reasons, because that would be the religion that was everybody was forced to, to believe. The Buddhists are doing that today. Dr. Price said, Derek, if you really want to have your mind blown, he told me this at his house. I even had to record him, like taking a clip of it. He said, you need to look at Buddhism right now. They have the same theological battles of, oh, you're part of that sect. Well, we're part of this. The same way the Muslims, are you Sunni? Are you, uh, are you this? Are you that? They're, they're debating the same things. And today, Buddhist scholars are arguing and debating, did Buddha exist? It's the same thing as what we have going on. Exactly, yeah. So when I entered this study, I, I think I entered just after 9-11, around 2000, because uh, that, that was a, a pivotal moment for me. Previous to that, at the age of 18, I, I'd been a soldier in the British Army, and I, and I served a tour in Northern Ireland. And I saw the, the end of the, the, the hatred for Protestants and Catholics that that appeared on, I mean, and I was quite young at the time and quite shocked by it. And I have to be honest, at that time, I didn't even know there was a, such a thing as a Protestant and Catholic, but I, I learned quite quickly. And that kind of simmered in, in, the, in my mind for years. And after 9-11, I thought, this, this is crazy. What is it that makes people about religions hate, hate them, you know, other people for believing something different so much that such an atrocity could be, uh, could be um, committed? So I said, said to myself, I'm going to start, I'm going to set myself a task of uh, researching these religions. I'll start with Christianity. I'm going to start with the Jesus character. Let's find out what we do and we don't know about him. And I'll be perfectly honest, at that time, although I wasn't religious, I did hold the view that, well, okay, the stories are blown, overblown, mythical exaggerations. But I did think that there was a person there in 30s who stood in front of Pilate and was executed. And, and the, the stories were created around that, so that event and um, promoted over the years. Uh, the research that I did over the probably 10 year period from then on just took me down a totally different path. And I was looking at analyzing all the texts, the, uh, the extant texts chronologically, not in the order they are in the Bible, and also in a matter that says, if I'm gonna read this text and this is the earliest text, I'm going to completely uh, wipe from my mind any of the information that come from the text that weren't in existence at the time that this was written and view it only with what's written in the documents. And I started to build a picture which told me that this guy is, uh, he's not um, historical. He didn't exist in this time period. 
whether he he existed previously, fifty or a hundred years previously, and is a, or is a mismatch of of other characters. I don't know. That's open to debate. But where it did lead me was this particular character in the Gospel of Mark, the canonical Jesus, the one to thirty common era Jesus, is a complete fiction. He's one hundred percent fabrication. Uh, the books, uh, Contra Ehrman and Seventy, explain what took me down that path, the journey that led me to to believe that. Uh, and the the websites that and the groups that get your your part of the groups as well, mythical versus historical Jesus. Some of the the arguments put over for historicity in those um, groups, I read those and yeah, I studied that. I, I took myself down that route and tried to prove those to myself and found that. They, they just don't stand up to scrutiny. They, particularly when people start saying, you know, we've got these, these writings for, from Pliny, Pliny's letter to Trajan, Trajan's reply to Pliny, Tacitus, Suetonius. And when you really analyze them, you come to the realization that that's evidence for Christians. And we know Christians existed. That is not evidence for the historical existence of the person they believed in. Now, that in itself doesn't mean he didn't exist. But it means that doesn't prove he did. We need to look for something more. But you can see a chronological creation of uh, earlier mythical Christ characters being distilled down at a certain point in history to a supposed real character for a specific reason by a specific set of people. And it's pure happenstance that that particular version of Jesus has come to us today via the wars of, of Constantine. Those wars hadn't happened. That's that version of Jesus probably wouldn't have come down to us. And if you said to someone in the streets today, "Well, what do you think of Jesus?" Then they'd probably say, "Jesus who?" We just wouldn't know. <laughs> so, or or they'll say, uh, "Well, yeah, my Jesus." Depending on their kind of Jesus, yeah. which everybody has. I want to read this uh, that you have on your uh, book seventy on Amazon. In the first century common era, era Judea, the Torah-compliant temple-adherent Jews followed a yearly ritual of animal sacrifice at the temple altar. In their theology, this was the only ritual that would assure the forgiveness of sins. It had been that way for centuries. In August of the year 70, the unthinkable happened. Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans, and the temple complex was destroyed. Along with it, the only means of sin forgiveness, what to do. This book forwards a thesis on what happened next and how that event was the pivotal trigger for the creation of what became the canonical gospels. It was the initiation of the motive to construct a new sin forgiveness process. That process was the conception of a fictional Jesus figure now accepted worldwide as factual. Some facts are so unplatable that I'm sorry, unplatable. Yeah that they are considered taboo, an issue not to be bro uh, broached. But this book does broach this major taboo issue and states a claim that Christendom will not relish. I agree. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you were talking earlier today, and I uh, got tagged by our, our friend uh, Jasper Scott. We're trying to figure out, like, what's Paul doing, right? Like, um, I think you touch on some of this maybe in your book briefly. I don't know, but... There, I, there, there is, I've got a major part uh, on Paul that uh, people are going to say, well, that's just crazy. That, that can't be the case. But even though the, the claim is crazy, I actually back the claim up with the reasons why I, I think what I do about Paul, and, and it fits. Now, as we were talking earlier with Bob Price, the fact that it fits doesn't mean it's true. Right. But it fits, so it's a version that could be true. In my honest opinion, I believe you know I believe it probably is, but but it it, so it needs to be put out there and it needs to yeah. be. Well, people, people, you know, I, I love that, Mike. I got to say up front right now, I'm a man of of open ideas. I've had people on my show that till this day I still don't agree with their idea, but I I, I allow the the free thought of communicating their ideas because they've invested from their perception a lot of time and energy in why they come to conclusions they do. Whether they're right or wrong, for me, I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to judge that. I bring them on. Even at the end of the day, I may not accept your thesis, right, at mm -hmm. this time. Then again, I might hear something that you might point out and I might go, how did I not see that? That's why I entertain ideas, keeping an open uh, platform for open ideas like this. So the title right there for me, 
I have to tell you why your title caught my attention and that little um, advertisement of that, uh, your book, you know, it's out now, you know, and it caught my eye 70. I was a full preterist and it's a very fringe group within Christianity. They're not even in orthodoxy at all. They, they, the new Testament has Jesus saying, I'm coming back, baby. Uh, in the gospels i'm coming back now this is just in the gospels this is why i find this very you got to get critical when you start looking at these texts and i used to not do this as a christian the gospels were really what not necessarily literally took place first but narrative wise of course those come first acts comes next then paul and all the letters and all that stuff and then revelation was last and scholars are now telling me revelation might be the earliest book in the new testament i'm going okay never thought that but i thought Jesus was coming back in the first century, which is what, because he said he was supposed to, and full preterism taught that. It was like the only position that said, not only did he say he did, he did. So mm -hmm. full preterists believe he, he kept his word. They have to redefine terms, whether you want to call it redefine or if they want to say, well, these are the proper way the terms are meant to be understood, whatever. They don't believe the literal resurrection, even though there are a few people like that. It's relevant to your title. Because that 70s pivotal almost on so many theories that are out there, and the Gospels make that pertinent as part of the, the point. Now, what does 70 have to do with the entire thesis that you present? Okay, so I, I didn't spot this initially doing uh, the research that I did of, of all of the documents, and it was when I came outside of the, um, the Christian documents, so I was reading more. Uh, the, not the Hebrew Bible, I can't read Hebrew, but, it, but obviously the Old Testament version of the Hebrew Bible, the, the Greek version. And I noticed that the number 70 was a popular number to use in prophecy in the Old Testament. There will be uh, 70 years, your land will be desolate, uh, 70 sons of Israel, 70,000 souls. 70 seemed to be a big thing for the Jews. But equally, of course, 37. 360 because 360 is a time you know that's so they talk about time time and a half and these are all astrological numbers now i'm not going damn brown here <laughs> no well that's ridiculous but the fact is uh, the ancients did revere these numbers they're numbers that are, are generated from simplistic naked eye stargazing and let's face it there was diddly squat else to do back then other than watch the sky at night <laughs> they studied it and they saw it as a clock and they came up with these rhythmic numbers 7 12 30 40 i've got a, an angle on 40 which might or might not be wrong uh, 360 but more interestingly 70 and 72 which we can see is used interchangeably in religious texts. yes um that led me to uh researching the procession of the equinox, which is where these numbers come from. Because an astrological age is how long it takes the sunrise on the vernal equinox to move enough on the horizon, which is 30 degrees, to take it into a different star sign, which gives us a different age. It takes an awful long time, uh, 2,160 years. So they were creating along the horizon, through this procession of the equinox, the ancients, uh, a clock. So an age would last, uh, it's, it's 30 degrees of movement on the horizon, and that takes 2,160 years. They called that a great month. But they also had a great day. A great day was how long it would take the sunrise on the vernal equinox to move one degree on the horizon. Now, it's actually, we know today, 71.6 years. They couldn't have been that precise. But interestingly enough, if, if they were to say, well, we think it takes 70 years, and it's 70 solar years, that's also 72 lunar years. And those two numbers became venerated numbers. And we can see them in, uh, well, you see them in e Egyptian mythology because a, a, a pharaoh's mummification process had to take exactly 70 days. We see it in Islam with the 72 virgins. Um, the Septuagint. Okay? The Septuagint is a book that's called The 70 that was written by 72 scribes. There's uh, 72 Buddhas on the temple in e Indonesia. Yeah. So, exactly. So it's an important number. So I did notice that it was also an important number to the Jews because there were quite a few prophecies with 70. There were also two very relevant prophecies with 70, which is Jeremiah, which initially says after the first temple is destroyed that you, your land will be desolate for 70 years. And 
wouldn't you know that the second temple was rebuilt and dedicated in the sixth year of King Darius, according to the Bible, which is exactly 70 years later. Now, that's hardly believable. It, clearly, when they come back from exile, they did rebuild their temple. Clearly, it was completed in the year of Darius, but in the sixth year of King Darius, so it was exactly 70 years after it was destroyed. If you go into Islam, you'll find that the, the Dome of the Rock, that stands on top of the sec Second Temple ruins now, happened to have been completed exactly 72 years, uh, lunar years, 70 solar years, after the Hijra of Muhammad. Another 70 year gap there. So you start to think, well, you know, you couldn't make this stuff up, but apparently, <laughs> many years ago, people actually did make this stuff up. <clears throat> and then you get to think, well, hold on. I know there is a bit of discrepancy in, in the Gospels about when Jesus was supposed to have been born. But it is, isn't it interesting that in the current uh, Christian calendar, the temple was destroyed in what we now call 70 AD in the year of our Lord. Uh, 70 common era for me, but 70 AD in the year of our Lord. So what, what does that actually tie in with the, with the Gospels? And doing the research, there is actually a, a strong argument to be made that, that, that does, does allow you to come away from the concept of, uh, I'll get this the right way around, Luke saying that, um, yeah, it's Luke with King Herod, I think that's the right way around, and, and Jesus is alive while Herod's alive, so he must have been born before uh, 4 BCE. And Matthew says there was a census of Quirinius. That didn't happen until six common era. So there's a 10 year gap. Actually, when you do more research on that, there is a strong argument in scholarship that says Herod died in one BCE. And it is more of a convincing argument of him dying in four BCE. And there is also an argument that um, Luke is saying that there were, that um, uh, Quirinius was governor of Judea on two separate occasions. And that he's talking of the first of his uh, uh, census operations. Josephus, where we get the six common era from, is talking about a second in a, sec in a, in a second uh, appointment. So you've got two gospels there with the birth narratives in that um, seem to be pointing you to Jesus being born exactly 70 years before the temple was destroyed. Well, now that's interesting because you're having the um, the person who creates this brand new theology is being born 70 years before the heart of the old one is utterly destroyed. And then you think back to the first temple being rededicated exactly 70 years after it was destroyed. Obviously, Muhammad comes uh, centuries later, but the same thing, there is a link with 70 there. You start to think, well, this is becoming too much of a coincidence. But Mark, what about Mark? That's the first gospel. Does that have any link to 70? And when you read it, initially you think, no, it doesn't. But when he talks of the temple destruction, there is a part in one sentence where he actually breaks the sentence in two pieces and, and sticks in the middle, let the reader understand, which is like a wink at the reader. So he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, open brackets, let the reader understand, close brackets, go run to the hills. Now, <clears throat> there is only one other extant document where that phrase appears, and it's in Daniel, and it is in the exact 70-year prophecy passage about it. So he <laughs> says, go and read that, and you will understand the esoteric nature of my gospel. He, this is he cool. So links it to 70. We then come to John. We're only left with John. John tells us um, that uh, the, he puts into the mouth of the priests, um, this temple has taken us, oh, I'm going to have to remember the exact, uh, this probably won't be the exact number of years, 45 years of the building. 46, 46. There's something about that, though. I don't want to make you lose track, but the the name Adam mm -hmm. in, I think, uh, both Septuagint and Hebrew, if I'm not mistaken, but yeah, in Greek for sure, uh, Alpha, Delta, Alpha, Mule calculates Alpha 1, uh, uh, Delta 4, Alpha 1, and then mule 40, that's 46. So technically, if you want to be esoteric, it took us 46 years to build this temple. It took us Adam to build this temple. This temple, yeah, you know, it's yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, wh when you take that phrase and, and you will, uh, will you build it up in three days? It, uh, if we say, well, John doesn't contest the fact 
that the earlier mention that Jesus was about 30 before he began his ministry and it's less than a year later he's got he's being um, crucified at 30. John doesn't correct that <coughs> and if we took the view of a, a real historical Jesus and he thought that Jesus wasn't 30 you think well by necessity he would have to so it's either on the the, the mythicist side of the fence or the historic side of the fence there, there is a good argument to say that John is saying that Jesus is 30 when he is crucified and he gives you this this clue in, to work out when the crucifixion took place because if you go to Josephus and John has used Josephus to do this to, to create his maths and have a look when the uh, the eighteenth year of Herod started because he actually says it was in the eighteenth year of Herod that the building started it took us forty six years to build it and you do the maths <clears throat> it lands you right on thirty common era for the crucifixion which means if you go back 30 years for the birth, that's exactly 70 years before the temple was destroyed. So in actual fact, all four gospels do create a narrative of a Jesus being crucified at the age of 30 and therefore being born exactly 70 years before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Wow, there's got to be something in that. Yeah, and Mike, I suspect, I just I, this is fascinating, what you just hope you guys let the listeners understand. I hope you're seeing this. Um, I suspect you probably go into this, and I'm not trying to steal your thunder because everybody's got to get the book. You just launched it, too. It's a red cover. You guys see the picture. Um, it, this, to me, is, drives home when Jesus says uh, the end of the age. So this ties in the astrological, combining it with something you're saying there's an event they're making significant to the changing over of the age and this is tying in with that 70 concept and i think like you said it's 71.6 to be more accurate but anything from 70 to 72 kind of covers that window if you will yeah and we know they picked whether they were able to work it out accurately or not we know whoever they were who were promoting the idea of venerating astrological numbers they picked 70 and they picked 72 and they were using those two interchangeably uh, we even know in, there are differences between 70 and 72 between uh, Greek and Latin versions of the New Testament with the amount of fossils that were sent out. I mean, one says there were 70 fossils, another one says there were 72. Um, the, the generations of um, uh, from Noah, so there's 70 generations or something. Right. Generations of Noah. So we know. Look, look at the 144,000 in Revelation. That's double the 72. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but that that put me down a complete different path. I thought, well, if if that didn't happen until after 70, and we know Mark's the first gospel written wasn't written until after 70, it looks like it was clearly written in response to the loss of the temple, and creates a kind of a, well, here is a replacement theology because we've lost the temple. Here is a reason for losing it. We were being punished because we rejected the Messiah. Here is a new sin forgiveness process. But what is Paul all about? If Paul wrote before the Gospels, what well, he's talking about a Jesus. But if, if it wasn't created until then, uh, how, how could they have just come up with the idea afresh? But Paul, 20 years earlier, uh, was already talking about a Jesus character. <coughs> That's where I... Studying Paul and Gnosticism, I think the, 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 the Gnostic texts we have now clearly second century onwards. But that, well, that's a more formed view of Gnosticism. And I believe some of them existed before the creation of, the, I'll call it literal Christianity, a, a real Jesus that the Gnostics created. I think some of them come before and some of them come after. And there is a, a mixture here of... Um, Christ myth theories, Christologies that existed previously. The gospel writers were taking uh, Christologies from non-temple compliant Jews that were following types of uh, Savior to Dead Christologies, from um, Gentiles from all over Galatia, Turkey, and Achaia and Corinth that also had uh, Savior figures that were Christologies. When the temple was destroyed, <clears throat> they took those myths they mixed them together with their own messianic prophecies from their own uh, scriptures and come up with a real version of this person on the ground and then promoted it. 
it, it got some traction, obviously. It, it became the de facto thing to believe after 325 Common Era when Constantine decided, I'm now the ruler of the world, I want one religion, one ruler, one God, and I'm going to pick Christianity. And um, by the way, sorry Gnostics, it's the literal version, you lose. And we know what happened after that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so if you've got that as a theory, you've got to go and look for, um, is there evidence that that could be the case? Could Gnosticism have existed before the literal creation of a, of a, a Jesus post-70, post-Temple destruction? When you start reading the text chronologically, with that mindset, you say, right, I'm going to forget Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and uh, 1,700 years of Christianity. I'm just going to read what Paul says. And you start to think, hey, yeah, this guy is talking about a mythical Jesus. Then you will come to the realization that whoever wrote the Gospel of Mark was fully aware of the content of Paul's letters. But Paul is not aware of the content of the Gospel of Mark. And they are actually preaching different Jesus uh, theologies. <clears throat> and Paul himself was preaching one of different Jesus theologies at the time that he preached. And he even tells us that himself. If someone comes and preaches you a Jesus other than the one I preach you, you put up with it easy enough. Uh, he says that about people in Greece and he says that about people in Galatia. So that tells us that at the time of Paul's preaching, other people were preaching different Christologies took them Paul in Greece and Turkey, and the literal version hadn't yet been created. If we go with the consensus view of uh, Paul writing in the 50s, it hadn't even been conceived of for another 20 years. It's funny you say that, Mike. I just wanted to point out, like, just anyone, basic common sense, just kind of thinking about this, and it doesn't mean I'm right about this, but it's like different Jesuses. How can you have different Gospels? It just... To me, it's really weird. The guy was here 15 years ago, guys. How can we get all these different Jesuses and different Christ? And even if an angel of light come, what? 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 What do you mean? I mean, why? Why would an angel of light come to you? <laughs> so it's it just kind of weird language in a literal sense. Is kind of strange to me. But yeah, I agree with you. Uh, well. Actually, I, I'm not a, I can't read Hebrew, I can't read Greek, and I've done some study on uh, the etymology, I think that's the way it's pronounced it, of, of the word. Now, this might be right, it might be wrong, but it's what I, I can perceive at the time, uh, at the moment. Uh, Jesus Christ isn't actually, in its original form, a name, it's a label, and it literally means the anointed saviour. And so this Christ this anointed saviour, existed in several different Christologies. Paul's was one of them. It wasn't <coughs> a literal Christology. Paul is uh, um, of the opinion that there was an event that happened in antiquity, probably in the mythical realm, that was a death and resurrection in the flesh because uh, sin is a human flesh a fiction. It needs to be defeated. So a god comes in the guise of a human and dies and resurrects for us, and, and that tells us that we can resurrect. Because at, at the end of the day, if a god did that as a god, what does that prove to a human? I mean, he's a god, of course he can do that. But if he did it as a human, that, that's a sign. That, that tells us something. And that's as far as Paul's Jesus theology goes. It doesn't go any further, and it's interesting to note that if you read all seven, the authenticated, they're called authenticated letters of Paul, his Jesus character actually doesn't say anything to anybody other than to Paul a couple of times in an apparition. He makes no speeches to anybody. He gives no teachings. And also, Paul gives out a few teachings, but he doesn't attribute them to Jesus. He, he, he takes the credit for them. So he's not saying, oh, and by the way, our Lord said this, and our Lord said do that. He says, I tell you, this is what you should do. With it. This is his theology. So Paul is living in a landscape where there are several Christologies there are non-temple non compliant Jews that don't like the idea of temple law. They've got a, a savior figure, a Christ, Messiah. There are Gentiles in Turkey and there are Gentiles in Britain. And they've got their own versions of the savior Messiah. And at this stage, the only, uh, it's only formed to the point of if you follow these particular rituals and you worship the Messiah and you believe in his death and resurrection, when you die, you too will resurrect. And that's as far as it, it got. Along comes Paul, 
and he's got an apocalyptic message. Yeah, he just wants a bit of attention. He's, he's a bit darker and he wants a bit of attention. And he's going to add the eschatology into the mix. He's telling people, well, oh, you're Christ figure. He spoke to me. He told me the eschaton is coming in our lifetime. So we need to get right and ready with God. And he's sending a new message to these groups that already existed. Some of them liked the message and accept it. I would suggest the Jews didn't. And they just told him to look, nap off, go away. So I'll go and talk to the Gentiles. And he got some traction there. He didn't create those churches. They already existed and they converted to Paul's message. And that's the way it stayed until the temple was destroyed. And the Jews were then thinking, or certain Jews, not all of them, hell, we need to explain why Yahweh has just allowed the Romans to destroy the Holy of Holies and, and defeat, defeat us utterly. So they come up with, well, it must have been a punishment. Yeah, we must be being punished. Uh, they've looked at Jeremiah, they've looked at Daniel, and they, they're reinterpreting uh, these 70-year prophecies. Now, Daniel is already a, a reinterpretation of Jeremiah in itself, but they're looking at Daniel and basically reinterpreting it again in light of what's just happened to them. And they come up with the conclusion, Daniel was a warning. He's telling us that when the Messiah arrives, our Messiah, if we reject him, we will be punished 70 years later. And look, we've just been punished. Ergo, he must have come 70 years ago and we rejected him. And this was the result. The but don't worry, <laughs> because he, here is another theology that is the replacement for the temple. Uh, and the book 70 is explaining uh, in a lot more detail than I've just put over there how I've come to, to that thesis and how it pans out after that. Now, I have to say, <coughs> like Christ, it's a theory. It could be right. It could be wrong. The one thing I would uh, uh, pin my colours to the master and say, the gospel Jesus, the one to 30 gospel Jesus, is complete fiction. That's a fact. How it came to be uh, considered factual by millions of people for almost 2,000 years now, that's where my thesis is saying, I believe this happened. And it's for people to decide whether they, that's correct or that's incorrect or as... as you, you mentioned Bob Price says there are loads of different uh, ways you can explain this this data that are all equally valid. They're not necessarily, well, they can't all be true and maybe none of them are true or maybe one of them is true. But we need to get these ideas out into the, uh, into the field and not just the academic field. Open it up to everybody, get loads of people, get them interested in this, get them researching it and get them questioning it and saying, well, I do accept that. I don't accept this. And I think this guy's going down the right line. So that, that's a, 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 in a coconut shell. <laughs> I'm not sure what a coconut <laughs> shell. A quick thesis of the book. And it goes on uh, a lot deeper. Uh, one teaser is, and, and people will say, hell, this guy's crazy. I don't <laughs> think Paul wrote in the 50s. I think Paul was preaching and writing circa 72 BCE. And, and I give my reasons for that. So I'm saying that around 72 to 50 BCE, around Greece uh, and Turkey, modern day Greece and Turkey, there were several forms of Christology and Paul was preaching one of them. So, okay. There you just, Hiroshima, you know? Um, that is a very interesting, someone told me that you, you had a position on Paul that goes BCE. And I said, really, I'm interested in hearing more. Do you go into great detail in your book, kind of like uh, on that section in there trying to explain that or? <coughs> yeah, um, I go into a lot on reverse construction. How, and that's the, the Jesus story for, for Mark. Mark is a reverse construction for the, for the 70 year prophecy. Uh, how do we get to Paul preaching uh, in the 50s? Well, we get to that from Acts, basically. There is nothing in the letters of Paul that you can use to say, see that there? That means Paul wrote in the 50s common era. There's nothing in the letters of Paul that will allow you to say that. You have to take the information from Acts to come up with that conclusion. But follow it through. The, <coughs> the gospel writers 
clearly had in their possession the works of Josephus, and they clearly had in their possession Paul's epistles. That they didn't necessarily know who Paul was or when he lived, but they had these epistles. And they create the Gospel of Mark, the first one, or a person, from the information from those two documents. But again, they're using reverse construction. Now, clearly, if you're going to do that, Jesus died in our story in 30, and Mark, uh, Paul doesn't get involved because he's persecuting the Christians. So he's not initially a Christian. So he's not in the Gospels. And, and clearly, he couldn't be. It would destroy the, the concept. You've got the four Gospels that are written, and all four of them repeat the, um, the apocalyptic uh, idea of Paul saying that in our lifetime, Jesus is coming back. And you think the problem you're going to have is if that message was uh, sold and accepted and people started worshipping it based on the Gospels, there will come a time when that lifetime played out and future followers were saying, well, hey, it, it didn't happen. So Christianity version 1.2, Acts of the Apostles, and it comes. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to tell you a new story, a new softer story, which is, yeah, the end of the world isn't going to happen in our lifetime, but if you carry on worshipping Jesus, get christened, follow all the rituals, when you die, you will go to heaven, and the end times will happen at some time in the future. It's a softer message, great for future generations, and let's face it, Christians have been waiting for Jesus to come back ever since, and every generation has said, we're the generation that you're going to come back in. But the gospel writers said, so, sorry, uh, Acts of the Apostles, the writers there are saying, where do we put Paul? Well, clearly you can't have him before 30, because that really screws the story up. We don't want him after 70, because that's when the temple was destroyed. Put him in the middle. Now, we, we've taken the information from his letters. We've written a, uh, a, a clearly fictional uh, voyage of Paul, a, a story of Paul. Where are we going to place him? They place him in the 50s. Where did they get the information to put him into uh, uh, Achaia in, during the, the reign of Gallio? <clears throat> and that's where they get, they're, they're reading Paul and they can see that he says that he had to escape from Damascus while uh, the, the governor of King Aratus is guarding uh, Damascus. And that has been taken for centuries to be a reference to King Aratus IV because he was in power at the right time for Paul to be uh, preaching or writing letters in the 50 and preaching just before 50 common era. But the problem we got there is King Aratus IV never had any sovereignty over Damascus. It, Damascus wasn't in the Nabataean kingdom during the reign of King Aratus IV. And King Aratus IV, during the reign of Tiberius, was actually on a war footing with Rome. Uh, Tiberius had told his uh, governor of Syria to march south, attack the Nabataeans, and send him King Aratus, dead or alive. So if there was any involvement from King Aratus at all, in Damascus, it couldn't have been until after Tiberius had died and Caligula became the emperor. There's no evidence, there's no extant evidence to say that uh, Caligula favoured Aratus IV and gave him control of Damascus. But that's been suggested to try and um, fit the narrative. Well, I'm looking at that differently and saying, actually, no, that's what the gospel writers have done. Uh, the, the writers of Acts have said, well, the earliest, if we're going to say he's talking about Aratus IV, the earliest it could be there is in the first year of Tiberius. That's 37 common era. But hey, look at Galatians. He's saying there's at least 14 years between his uh, escape from Damascus <clears throat> and all his travels. He hasn't been anywhere near Greece at this point, given the list of the places he's been. So <clears throat> we've got to say uh, 37 uh, common era plus this 14 years is the earliest we can put him in Greece. That puts him there in 51. Okay, so who's in charge of Achaia in 51? Do you know it's Gallio? Great. In our story, we place him in front of Gallio, and that time stamps him exactly where we want him to be. So I'm thinking, if they've done that as a reverse construction to place Paul there, all we're doing is accepting what they've said, and we're reading it, and people are saying, hey, do you know, uh, Aratus IV could have had control of um, Damascus during the reign of Caligula. Well, he could have done, but there is no extant documentation that says he did. 
<clears throat> now, if you look at Aratus III, who lost control of who, uh, where um, Damascus was part of the Nabataean kingdom, he lost control of it in 72 BCE. You say, well, okay, so place Paul in uh, Damascus pre-72 BCE and writing his letters afterwards, 50. Then follow that through and look at the letter of Clement, which references Paul's letter to the Corinthians, because he's writing to the Corinthians, but at the same time calls the church an ancient church. Well, I mean, if you place uh, one Clement where we want to place it today, United States Common Era, it, it couldn't have been written then because he's clearly talking about a temple that exists, so it's got to be 70. He knows nothing about the Roman War, so it's got to be uh, 66 at the earliest, and he's calling the church in Corinth an ancient church. If Paul's writing in 72 BCE, and he just approaches churches that already exist, then yes, the church could, could be an ancient church. It does fit. It doesn't fit the other way around. So, wow, that, that's quite, <laughs> quite deep. Uh, yeah, concept. now you're taking me on a journey, though. That, yeah. That's very interesting and something I noticed with the eschatology. And when I say eschatology, I'm not just saying afterlife uh, ideas. I'm, I'm ref referencing eschatology in terms of something that was supposed to take place, uh, obviously. Yeah. yeah, in times. And this Paul, Pauline eschatology that um, me and Jasper were talking about earlier when we were discussing the conversation that you were having with him on the Facebook group, uh, something that kind of caught my eyes was I kept thinking about the Qumran sect of the Dead Sea Scroll. I kept thinking about the teacher of righteousness, the, the, uh, there's the people of light and the people of darkness. And these things are used by Paul. Uh, wouldn't it have, I'm not going to say it couldn't have had significance in the fifties, not saying, you know, that's not possible. I'm saying it could be, but wouldn't this also play a role, especially even 72 BCE, if, uh, the, the Qumran sect is obviously, you know, there, there's a lot more of it, uh, going on. It seems that, um, uh, it seems like he could be influenced by their type of eschatology that something's going to happen soon. And it, of course, gets painted over and edited and, and probably uh, tampered with at some point when orthodoxy wants to canonize Paul. Because uh, Dr. Price even thinks that Paul or proto-Paul, the, maybe the original writings that may be there, um, were Gnostic in nature and they had to tame them in some sense. Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that the eschatology, though, that Paul has is, and I, I mean, I'm not well read in this, um, but it sounds like they thought the angels of God were going to assist them in, in taking out the Romans. I mean, obviously, Maccabean revolt and war that took place, you know, they're, they're hating these Gentiles that were over them. Um, do you think that there was a blend of that type of eschatology from the Jewish kind of uh, arena there, which they were kind of Gnostic too, from what I understand. Mm -hmm. And then blending in Gentile pagan Christ figure or Hellenistic uh, Jewish Hellenistic Christ uh, savior cult mystery school stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, his, Paul has, um, I, I think Paul just wanted some attention. And so you had these these schools of thought on the Christologies, and at that time they weren't um, they weren't apocalyptic. They they weren't talking about the eschaton, but clearly in Jewish scripture and the Temple Jews at that time, uh, probably from about uh, fourth century BCE onwards, they they really started to bring uh, end time prophecies in, into their work, and they then started to believe in there would be this big and terrible day at the end of the world. So. I think Paul just said, right, I, I'm going to mix things up here. I'm going to get myself some attention. I'm going to say, you're Christ. He's spoken to me. He told me that the end time is coming. And I think he tried to, this is, this is all um, uh, speculation, obviously. I think he tried to sell that message to the Jews, the, the non-temple compliant Jews. And I don't think he got a lot of change. I think he got sent away with a flea in his ear. So, well, I'll go and try the, uh, I'll go to Turkey and I'll go to Achaia and I'll go to Corinth and I'll try them. And I think he did get some traction there and he started to convert those Christologies to uh, uh, an end time Christology. And, and that's exactly what you're saying. He started to merge Jewish eschatology with Christologies 
and then we come up with the, the proto-Gnostics, I would say, the earliest forms of, of some kind of Gnosticism. If you look at the, um, the ascension of Isaiah, I find that really interesting because that talks specifically of there being uh, two worlds in the firmament. Without a doubt, when you read it, it's in the firmament, there are two worlds. There is the world here with the, flesh, the people of the flesh, and then there's the world that the people of the flesh can't see, the, the world that is hidden to the flesh, and it's a duplicate. Well, the ascension of Isaiah has <coughs> Jesus coming down several levels of heaven and being in the future, this is a prophecy to happen in the future, in the future, being uh, crucified and coming back to life after three days and then reascending up, but only as far as the world in the firmament that's hidden from the flesh. So in that uh, version, he doesn't come anywhere near earth. He gets um, crucified in the future, and that's going to be at the, the end time. That's when the eschatology is going to, to happen. So the ascension of Isaiah is a, is a Christology which has an end time. It has a death, it has a resurrection, uh, but it doesn't happen on earth and it's going to happen in the future. And Jesus in that uh, theology has never visited earth. <clears throat> when you look at Paul, it's not a lot different other than the, the crucifixion did happen in the past in, in, in the ancient world, and it seems to have happened on earth in the flesh. But it, although, you know, it's, it's like the same, 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 but different. It, it's very, very similar, but there are slightly different um, uh, aspects to it. When you look at Irenaeus's uh, critique of Valentinian's type of Gnosticism, now this is quite a, an evolved Gnosticism. It's come centuries later. We're probably 100, right. 200 common era now. He is, he is a full on. Um, a dualist there is the the demiurge uh, and there's the good so the good exists in the pleroma outside of the universe and the demiurge was um, ejected from the pleroma and knows nothing of what's going on inside he's ejected to the chaos outside and he takes the chaos and from it he forms the world and he forms man and his uh, mother, Sophia, from inside the Pleroma, sees what he's created, breathes wisdom into his creation, creates men, and men start worshipping the Demiurge, and the Demiurge says, I am the only God. So we get a Jesus there created in the Pleroma, who's sent from the good to the earth to tell people, hey, you're worshipping the wrong God. He's, he's, not the, he's not the real God. The good's the real God, but he doesn't get crucified and he doesn't resurrect. But again, that's not a lot different to Paul. The only difference there is Paul thinks the, the world, the wicked world is ruled by the devil and his archons, whereas uh, the Vanatilians believe the wicked world was ruled by the Demiurge, which was Yahweh. Right. So you can see there is a lot of overlap and a lot of parallel in all these different forms of Gnosticism. They're all feeding off of each other and just coming up with their own slightly different versions of them. That's what I was going to ask is like, and I ha I'm going to ask Dr. Price to get his thoughts on this as well. And I'm sure uh, it, it's an interesting question. I think the gospels act like Christ came. Of course, they, they portray it in history, of course, and they put him in a time and they anchor him and whatnot. Um, and it appears he comes, he lives, or he's born, he lives, he dies, he resurrects or ascends, if you will, after he resurrects. And he claims he's going to come back. So there's like two comings of Christ. There's, there's here he is on earth, then oh, he ascends back to heaven, and then boom, he's coming back to earth. Paul, I wanted to know if Paul only has, he's coming and he hasn't come yet. So kind of like uh, in Paul's idea of Christ, does Paul have an idea where, where Christ did come in the past at some point, and he left again, and he's coming again, like a second coming? concept or is is paul thinking when the christ comes he'll put an yeah. end to all sin like he he hasn't come yet but he's coming and um i asked that because i think in jewish thought from jews that i've listened to and talked to they believe that when the messiah comes he's gonna do his job now i don't know if that's going over into paul's thinking or not but i just wondered because i know the gospels make him come twice so to speak or he's supposed yeah. to yeah, that, that, that idea does come from Paul. In Paul, uh, Jesus was crucified and resurrected in antiquity uh, 
and he doesn't say whether it was in the mythical realm or on earth, but he tells us it has happened and that that event um, saved us from sin. But be, be careful, be ready, because before we all die, before this generation passes away, he's coming back to initiate the end time. That, that's Paul. So you can see that flavor being um, uh, passed into the Gospels, because all four, uh, so I don't, I'm not sure about John, but definitely the three synoptic Gospels all parallel back that um, the end is going to come. We're not going to know when, but it's coming soon and it's coming in our lifetime. Yeah. But as you say, they've taken uh, Paul's concept of a Jesus that, that died and resurrected in the mythical realm in antiquity and said, no, he died and resurrected on earth uh, in 30, what, in the 16th year of Tiberius, which is right. nearer to us. Yeah, and yeah he's, he's coming back. Yeah. Okay. There's such high, high theology. I was telling people, yeah. I was like, his, his Christology is so well developed. I just find it weird that 20 years ago this you know oh this real guy died and and they developed such a such a brilliant uh well-developed christology of a supposed recent figure from him uh you know what i mean like to me it's yeah. like this just it just uh i have I'm not saying it's not possible i mean look uh, anything's possible yeah. i have a hard time accepting that i've even I've, I've said that to quite a few people even with Rabbi Tobia Singer, who I had on here, who takes the historicist angle, who says it's cognitive dissonance and that, you know, uh, they were very close to this uh, Messiah. And when he died, they just couldn't live with the fact that he died. And so they had experiences of him. Like if you lost your mom or something like you would experience them, probably a lot of people, even healthy people, they say up to like 15% of people experience their loved one post-mortem. And and uh, anyway, there's that long drawn out cognitive dissonance uh, route, but as much as this is developed, I'm thinking, no, I think this is a school of thought that's, uh, that's been going on. And it's, it's uh, now whether they attached it to a guy, maybe, uh, but I like what we're doing here. We're at least open-minded to discussing it. It's not like we're all uh, cult following mythicists that uh, <laughs> yeah. we must believe he didn't exist, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not an atheist agenda. It's a search for, did this guy exist in this time frame or didn't he? Yeah. And I'm open to the idea that, that there is a, a pistache of uh, characters from a previous time frame. I, I'm, I'm at the position where, yeah, but this character in the gospel of mark no that is that is complete fiction no right. one called jesus of nazareth stood in front of pontius pilate in the 16th year of tiberius and was crucified that that didn't happen i've lost the sound on you now oh i'm sorry i said I right know. right <laughs> <laughs> yes sir um sorry wife needs the car keys um so <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, this, this, I got to get your book. Um, you said it's on audio or is it going to be, I know it's on ebook e and um, of paperback. course paperback. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's not on audio right now, right? Okay. Um, no, I don't have a voice for audio. It's okay. No, no, no. You did great. Uh, we were concerned about his accent. We were wondering if you guys were going to have to have the gift of tongues to be able to understand him, but <laughs> You know, that, that gift ceased a long time ago, so you guys are crap out of luck, you know? <laughs> um, Mike, is there anything you would want to tell of the audience? Obviously, they need to get the book and read this material and really try to wrap their heads around it. I really like uh, different ideas, you know? But uh, is there anything you'd like to share with them before we close out? Yeah, I think um, let, let's start questioning whether this guy did exist in the 30s or not. From, uh, from a UK perspective, because if it transpires that uh, this person didn't exist, all well and good, that doesn't actually change a lot of people within people's rights to be Christian, to be spiritual or not Christian. But it does mean we can say, hey, you've got to withdraw yourself from the education system. You've got to withdraw yourself from governance and you certainly need to start paying tax if you're making money out of your churches. Yeah. But if you can establish the fact that this guy did actually exist, then maybe fine. Because my take is that we wouldn't dream of allowing um, astrologists to go into the school and present to infant school children. I don't know what you call it in America. To us, it's infant school, but five to six year olds. That um, there's some merit in uh, staring into a crystal ball or, or reading the stars or you know looking in tea leaves. 
we, we, we would laugh it out of existence. Now, if this Jesus character didn't exist, then there's not a lot of difference in asking them to sit down every morning, put their hands together and pray to a person that's supposed to have died 2,000 years ago, the saying, well, we've got Mystic Meg coming in tomorrow to run assembly and she's going to tell all your, you know, read all your palms. Yeah, so <laughs> the, the, I think we need to be open enough to say, let, let, let's, let's confront this elephant in the room. Let, let's find out whether he did or didn't exist in history first and then take it from there. Um, once we establish, if we do end up establishing that he didn't exist in history, how we got here is a whole different um, uh, range of investigation. And my theory is, is putting through a theory of how that happened. It's not necessarily correct, but other people could then start looking at it a bit more open-mindedly. Because since the 18th century, all research has been under, let's face it, it's been under duress serious duress from a very powerful Christian organization, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church of England, to make the text fit the gospel narrative. And we need to get away from that kind of scholarship and say, forget that, do it open-mindedly. You know, let's, let's find out whether this Paul believed in the same Jesus as the gospels, or is he talking about a completely different Jesus as a proto-Jesus that existed uh, decades or even centuries earlier? And that's where we need to go with this uh, field. And maybe 20, 30 years from now, it, the, the field will really be opened up and uh, you know, some serious scholars will start looking at this in a big way. And then this way, we've already got it. Cario, you've got to say, serious scholar, and he's put some really important questions on the table and said, look, that, that is a, a question to be um, debated and to be answered. And uh, to, for other scholars to come along from Christology side of the fence and um, just poo poo it because it's not the consensus is ridiculous. Yeah. I'm Unless with you. I'm with you. Uh, it's refreshing to hear people go into the avenues that aren't explored. Uh, when you go to academics, you go to do the research and stuff. Um, it's almost like uh, the consensus has already made their mind up in terms of uh, what's worth looking at. Mm -hmm. because nothing else matters or they see the evidence irrelevant to proving they have enough other weighted evidence and that the church throughout history you know the way i look at it is this when i found out what i was being taught by my church wasn't necessarily true it made me go okay what is what what is real what is going on i needed to know i mean even the eschatology i didn't understand i was like hold on okay how can you guys still be preaching he's coming when he said that two thousand years ago and it was supposed to happen soon oh because a day is like a thousand years yeah. or second peter you know uh the lord is not slack concerning his promises some count slow uh, but long suffering that's why he hasn't come that's why the promises haven't happened yet uh he's waiting to get more people saved before there there's an excuse of course to prolong the eschaton and um, I, I started to see full predators of it, but then I started escaping the box when I saw, oh, Jesus looks so much like Osiris in many ways, and, and, yeah. and not identical. Just so many things made me go, why do I think mine's right, everyone else's is wrong? Then I started to expand my mind, and, and um, I, I said to myself, wow, look at the church fathers arguing with the pagans about how true mm -hmm. their Christ is. They're like trying to convince everyone that theirs is the truth and everything else is a lie because Justin Martyr had, uh, maybe it was Justin Martyr who agreed and was like, look, yeah, it looks just like, you know, these other deities, but, um, you know, it's just like that. You can worship him. It's not a big deal. And then someone else comes on and says the devil planted it's these false. Martyr into Italian, yeah, diabolical mimicry. Yeah. yeah. So it tells me, I mean, right there, it tells me they're willing to, to just like today, they're willing to argue on what they think they're right about, even if they're wrong or if they're lying or whatever. Can you trust the yeah. church? And that's when I have a huge red flag that pops up. And so I am very appreciative of folks like Dr. Price, even if he's wrong, okay? Because Dr. Price is using a scientific method when he's researching this. What he's saying is, I don't trust you, and I'm going to look beneath the surface – I'm not going to go with what says on the text flat out. I'm looking for problems so I can dig deeper. I'm looking for contradictions because he said we can learn from those to find stuff that might be going on behind them. And what I'm getting at, I mentioned this the other day, 
Dr. Ehrman presumes innocence until proven guilty. Yeah, yeah. We have enough reason to start with they're guilty. Let's see if they're even honest about any of it. And so Price says guilty until proven innocent. They're mm -hmm. starting from two different angles and working in. And Price says, hey, maybe Ehrman's approach on innocent until proven guilty could be true. Not denying it couldn't be. But I don't have good reason to believe what we have today has honestly not taken shift and change and mold to new sects of Christianity that want their theology and they want their ideas pushed. And so he's trying to dig, you're trying to dig, Dr. Carrier's trying to dig, a lot of people are trying to dig. And of course, don't touch my, your, the consensus says, my academic uh, PhD says, my money that comes in says, the, the college I work for says, who do you think you are to even question what we've already done? This isn't brain surgery, okay? We're not out here like saying, all right, you're not a scholar, but can you cut me open and get this tumor out? No, that's scientific. Their historical approach, how scientific is the methodology, yeah. uh, it depends on if you can trust the text. Like Dennis R. McDonald said in his Dionysian Gospel recently, he says, Papias supposedly talks about being a disciple of someone of John, the Johannine tradition. He goes, but let me start off by saying, if you can trust Eusebius, then yeah. we can go. Yeah. I, I don't know if I can trust Eusebius. So it's like, I mean, come on, you know? And we know for absolute, so we have uh, extant documentation for edicts from the Roman emperors post 325 that actually instruct heretical Christology texts will be found, will be destroyed. And you, you get to thinking, well, why did you need to destroy them? If your Jesus character is real, why did those texts need to be destroyed? Why were we not allowed to read what those texts said? There has to be a reason for them having been destroyed. You know, Mike, I'm with you a million percent, brother. And I hope, just I hope, we find a discovery that, uh, that just blows the lid off. Or at least finally answers the question with good... Uh, that we find out it's not a fraud. We find out that it's not like uh, the, the recent discoveries of some of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were, you know, fraud and made up. I'm talking legit archaeological evidence that can either show Gnosticism was running rampant sometime around this period or, you know, something that just uh, lets us know or says, here was Jesus, but he, you know, this is what he did. And, and here's what, okay, cool. It was just a guy. But yeah. at, at that point, even then, the Christ never existed. The no. guy, maybe, but yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mike, thank you so much. This is good. Uh, everybody, go right now, down in the description. If you can't get the book right this second, for whatever reason, we understand what's going on with COVID-19, everybody's struggling, um, put bookmark it and get it as soon as you can. Uh, you can probably get a little sneak peek on Amazon there, you know, let you get you a few pages in to kind of, you know, see what's going on in the text, but uh, definitely help them out, man. Cause people like this, I love promoting what you guys do to get this information out there, at least just for freedom of thought. It's an entertaining thing and it's a wonderful mental exercise to kind of wonder what if, you know, what if you're right? And every, what if you are right about your thesis? That would change the whole game, right? I, I, well, it would certainly change the game in in, uh, in the UK. We could then argue for separation of church and state, which um, I believe quite a few people would like to see in the UK. Uh, yeah. We wouldn't want to, I mean, personally, I, I, I am not religion bashing. I am not uh, against Christianity or Judaism, uh, and I'm all for freedom of religion and freedom of thought, and I would fight virulently for that. But I, I, I get... Um, my beef comes when that is being foisted on children in the schoolroom uh, and, and the law says you must do this. So mm. it, it would allow us to challenge that if my theory is correct. <laughs> wow. Well, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, it's been, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you and um, to talk about the work. Thank yeah, you. I think we'll do another one once I read the work. <laughs> but but even then, I'm going to have to hold my tongue so we don't give away too many secrets for those who haven't read it. Um, I really do appreciate that. And for those of you watching who haven't figured everything out by now, we are Myth Vision.
join our Patreon 